one soul abiding in two bodies. That's how Aristotle described the relationship between Alexander the Great and his companion, Hephaestion. Alexander built one of the biggest empires the world has ever seen. It's undebatable that Alexander is one of the greatest military conquerors of all time. But what is debatable is the nature of his sexuality. Some modern researchers say in Alexander's time, that wasn't even a thought at all. The concern was more over whether or not Alexander was a top or bottom. Today, I'll talk to one of the leading experts on the life and the love of Alexander the Great, someone who is currently on the quest for the lost tomb of Alexander, Andrew Michael Chug. Let's start by just giving people who may not be familiar with Alexander the Great a broad overview. What is it about him that's so significant to world history? Well, he kind of crashes onto the scene and gets very close to conquering the entire world, closer than anybody else has ever gotten anyway. Um, he does start off as Crown Prince of Macedonia, the largest kingdom in northern Greece. Um, he recognises that he has a heritage that he has to live up to, and uh, he supposedly performs a few interesting feats when he's a child, like taming Bucephalus, the untamable horse, uh, by realizing that the horse is starting from his shadow and turning him to face the sun so he can't see his shadow. Um, then he leads the charge in his father's greatest battle, Battle of Chironia, when he's 18, leads a cavalry charge, a crashing cavalry charge uh, that defeats the Theban band, a band of male lovers from the city of Thebes, uh, and wins the Battle of Chironia, and that effectively is the conquest of the whole of Greece for his father. Then two years later, his father's assassinated by um, one of his ex-male lovers and Alexander inherits the throne. And Ale Alexander's father has this plan to invade Asia um, and reconquer the Greek parts of Asia from the Persian empire. And Alexander decides that's a worthy way to begin. So off he sets, he surprises himself perhaps with the degree of his success and he carries on. There are three uh, crashing dynamic battles, Granicus, Issus, and Gaugamela, and suddenly he's conquered the entire Persian Empire. So what does he do for an encore? He goes and conquers India. Uh, well, I suppose via um, southern central Russia, as we would call it now, which he spent two ugly years in um, with a lot of tribal fighting. Um, but then he sets off for India with an army of 120,000 Greek soldiers and about as many hangers on, a quarter of a million people, and uh, conquers a large part of what's now Pakistan and northern India before his army decides they've maybe had enough. They're hearing rumors of gigantic uh, formations of enemy elephants and things. Uh, so Alexander sits in his tent and broods for a while, but then he figures out, ah, oh, there's a way around this. My, I wanted to get to the ocean. This is the big objective, the outer ocean, the edge of the world. But I've heard that if you go down the River Indus, you can get there as well. And I'm sort of going sideways and halfway backwards. So maybe I can get away with that. And he does. And so he goes down to the ocean and uh, conquers all the uh, Indian tribes on the way. This is basically the River Indus. Um, and then he returns across uh, the desert uh, to uh, the center of his empire. And he dies in Babylon, I say, from a mosquito bite that he got in the marshes a couple of, a few weeks before he fell ill and leaves the empire and an unborn son and an idiot half-brother um, because the, they're priest kings, the kings of Macedon, not really just kings, uh, the troops regarded as essential that another member of the family be the next king. So the troops basically elect um, the idiot half-brother and the unborn son as their next kings, uh, which is an interesting compromise, uh, which has been criticized by students of political thought ever since, but, um, but they made it sort of work. There's so much to dig into with just Alexander's life. I, just so much that I just want to jump into there, but we're here specifically to discuss his sexuality. And you write, to understand Alexander well, it is necessary to follow his heart more than his policies. When you dig into Alexander's heart, what do you find? 
you find a very small group of very important people to him in his life who were his supports in this marvelous adventure and who provided the backup um if you like to for him to succeed uh at these fabulous exploits um and i suppose principal among them are hephaestion uh the lover of his youth and bagoas the lover of his uh later years um the last seven or eight years of his life um there are uh, one or two women who were significant but um they're very much just uh greek queens um i suppose roxanne is the most significant woman in his life uh he did father two children by her there was one that died in india uh not very long after being born and then another who is this unborn unborn child when he died and who did for a while notionally at least become the king after alexander sometimes we call him alexander the fourth you talk a little bit about hephaestion there and, and he is one of if i'm not mistaken one of the most important relationships for alexander what do we know about the two of them together there isn't anything about them explicitly in the sources until uh, alexander gets to troy so he's already set out on his conquest of asia at that point and that's the first time when we read in the main sources, uh, Plutarch and Arian, about an interesting sacrifice that Alexander made at Troy to the shade of Achilles uh, and to Patrocles, or rather Hephaestion performed the sacrifice to Pat Patrocles. Now, Achilles and Patrocles, Patrocles were recognized as lovers uh, in Alexander's time uh and so the fact that Hephaestion is performing a sacrifice to uh Patroclus and Alexander is performing a sacrifice to Achilles is indicative of the relationship between them uh so that this is happening when Alexander's about 21 um uh, a whole year after he's becoming king become king but most of the relationship uh seems to have happened before then uh, even though that's the first place we pick it up in the main sources. It is mentioned in another source called pseudo Callisthenes or the Alexander Romance. It's a semi-mythological account of Alexander's career, but it contains quite a lot of truth, albeit in a muddled way. And in that account, uh, when Alexander was 15, he went with Hephaestion to the Olympic Games, which really did take place in that year. They only took place once every four years. So that's an indication that this might be a true story. Uh, and that uh, already makes Hephaestion and Alexander lovers at that point. Uh, and that's probably the truth. And there are other hints that they studied under Aristotle together. And that would have been between the time when Alexander was about 13 or 14 and when he was uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, something like that. For example, there are mentions of books of letters from Hephaestion to uh, Aristotle. Um, which indicates that there was a close relationship between the two. And that can only really have been built up, given that Hephaestion was with Alexander in Asia for most of the, their um, older years. Uh, that can only have been built up when they were used at the school in Macedonia, which Aristotle ran for Alexander and his companions. So there's fair, a fair amount of indication that uh, uh, they were lovers in their youth as well. There is a a small fragment in a writer called Athenaeus, who quotes another writer called Hieronymus, who's a relative of Alexander the Great's secretary, Eumenes of Cardia, who himself quotes Diophrastus, who is a pupil of Aristotle, uh, to say that Alexander was, uh, and it must have been in his youth, in his teenage years, his parents arranged a courtesan called Calixena, a Thessalian courtesan of quite a lot of fame, to go and sleep with Alexander because they were worried that Alexander might turn into a Guinness. Now, Guinness sounds like a drink of beer in Britain, <laughs> but, but uh, it's actually a, a masculine gender version of the word for a woman in Greek. Alexander's parents, Theophrastus said, who was a friend of Aristotle, 
uh, who was actually Alexander's tutor at this time, uh, he says that this Thessalian courtesan called Calixena was offered up to Alexander by his parents. Many teenage boys would uh, delight in such a thing nowadays, but uh, Alexander doesn't seem to have been very keen. We talk about Aristotle, who is said to have said about Hephaestion and, and, uh, and Alexander the Great, that they're one soul abiding in two bodies. And yes. then there's, there's this other famous, famous quote that says, Alexander the Great went on to conquer the world, but he was only defeated by uh, Hephaestion's thighs. Um, is that... Yes, that that comes from uh, a quote of Diogenes of Sinope, mm -hmm. uh, who is somebody that Alexander met. He's kind of the founder of the cynical school of philosophy. Um, he, Alexander met him uh, in Corinth when he was visiting, when he was a young king. Uh, he didn't exactly say that. He said that uh, Ale Alexander, he wrote a letter. This is supposedly a quote from a letter to Alexander saying, Alexander, take the rag uh, off your head. He meant the, um, the symbol of kingship, the diadem, as it's called. Throw that away and come to me and you will learn, uh, you know, how to be a good man and all that. Um, but then he says, but you won't because you are held back by Hephaestion's thighs. Um, and this allusions to thighs in the ancient Greek authors usually is a kind of a polite way of talking about male male sex um so he's he's essentially saying that uh alexander is tied to to hephaestion and that hephaestion in some sense is is the boss in the relationship there's a third one as well we could mention which is something that courteous says uh he's talking about another younger male lover and i've argued that it's probably bagarus because there isn't really anyone else and he's talking about uh, Bagus in the context of um, something that happened many years later in around uh, 328 BCE. Um, but what he says is he talks about Bagus and he talks about how attractive he was uh, to Alexander. But he said that he can't match Hephaestion in uh, basically virile charm. He's a... Uh, the word lepare, uh, meaning virile charm in Latin, but it also means um, a hair, which was a famous gift from a lover to the beloved. Uh, so he's kind of punning that Hephaestion is the top in the relationship with Alexander, whereas Bagus is the bottom in the relationship with Alexander. So it's another strong hint that uh, of the kind of relationship that was going on. That's fascinating. And it's fascinating because the more I, I talk about this, the more I dive into this topic, especially in that world at that time period, I think you and I had previously offline spoken about how the real scandal was not the fact that Alexander may have had a, a, a male lover, but the scandal was more so the fact that he was the passive, he was the bottom in these relationships. Well, yeah, a lot of people pretend he wasn't. Uh, and, and there was, there had to be a kind of polite pretense that Hephaestion was the bottom. And uh, a lot of people speak about, a lot of the ancient sources speak about the relationship in that kind of way. But these other rather subtle hints suggest otherwise. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, Hephaestion was reputedly taller, uh, for example, and this relationship started when they were in their early teens, probably. Uh, so there's nothing very surprising at that point. Alexander is still socially superior, so technically it should have been the other way around, according to standard Greek practice, but it's less surprising then. Uh, I think where we start to get a hint that it might have persisted for a fair while is there's a story of a of um it, i think it's from a one of plutarch's moralia tales uh he talks about how uh hephaestion is in the tent with alexander uh before the battle of issus i think uh and he says that uh there it was a matter of great embarrassment that instead of saying hello to Alexander when all the other generals turned up, he said goodbye to him 
because it implied that he'd been there overnight. And this was given as an example of embarrassment by, uh, of an embarrassing incident uh, by um, Plutarch in this instance. Would we say it's acceptable to think that these, the contemporaries for Alexander and Hephaestion did see them as lovers? Oh, they definitely saw them as lovers, yes. Uh, I mean, all of these illustrations, they, uh, even Arian, some people say Arian doesn't say that uh, Hephaestion is Alexander's lover. So obviously, because Arian is our top source, they say, I wouldn't agree with them, but because they say that, they say, oh, so you, you have to be skeptical about whether there was any relationship at all. Uh, however, they are wrong. Arian does uh, indirectly confirm, and he calls um, Hephaestion Alexander's Eromenos. The way he does it is in another work, not his writings on Alexander. He mentions that uh, the temples were burnt down when uh, when Alexander's Eromenos dies. And then in his Alexander works, he mentions that the temples got burnt down when Hephaestion died. So in his other work, he calls Hephaestion effectively, we know, because it's the same person who's dying, he calls him his Eromenos. Eromenos is the beloved, the bottom in the, in the relationship. The corresponding word is Erastes for the top. Uh, so he is talking about Hephaestion as Alexander's Eromenos. So that's what I mean when I say that a lot of sources politely refer to Hephaestion as the Eromenos, although there's really some doubt whether he wasn't really the Erastes. That's what these other... But the, the fact that, Ar that Arian does that means that even Arian explicitly, really, once you connect those two sources together, mm -hmm. um, it's his writings on Epictetus where he... he tells the story and he speaks of Alexander's Eromenos. Um, if, if you put those two things together, even Arian admits that they, they were lovers. The others are quite explicit. Curtius is quite explicit that they were lovers. Um, so there isn't really any room for doubt whatsoever. And even if you were to doubt what we said so far, there's the fact that Alexander completely collapsed and wailed over the body for day after day and had to be dragged away by his commanders when, when Hephaestion died unexpectedly. Um, that's and, another thing I'm so glad you're getting into because it's another parallel to the stories of Achilles and Patroclus, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and Alexander seems to have then gone through a process very like the funeral of Patroclus in Homer, uh, only he obviously built an even bigger funeral pyre. But to borrow from, from Madeline Miller, who's the author of this, this book called The Song of Achilles, she said for Achilles and Patroclus, when Patroclus had passed away, it was like, a bomb went off in his life. And we see that right with Alexander and Hephaestion. When Hephaestion dies, like you said, unexpectedly, it is like a bomb goes off in Alexander's life. Yes, he, he uh, does react very strongly. People have to tiptoe around him for the next few months. Uh, he goes off and uh, finds some kind of salvation in a kind of a midwinter campaign against some mountain bandits called the Cossians, and the sources say he slays them by his own hand as sacrifices to Hephaestion's soul. After a discussion, would you say it's almost certain that Alexander the Great, if alive today, applied to today's labels, would have fallen under the LGBT umbrella? Um, yes, I, I think so. I think the the thing that uh, would lean him towards what we'd call LGBTQ and all that today is the fact that it's clear that his emotional involvement with his male lovers, Hephaestion and Bagwas, was much stronger than with his female lovers. Uh, Roxanne was the strongest, but she doesn't really figure as a great political influence on Alexander, whereas Hephaestion and Bagwas really do. Uh, there are hints that Hephaestion and Bagwas were to some extent allies, by the way. There's a famous painting uh, of Alexander's lovers that's described by Lucian, uh, and it has um, Hephaestion consoling Bagwas when Alexander married Roxanne, uh, which wow. suggests that they weren't rivals at all. And you can possibly see why they weren't rivals, because 
one may have been an Erastes and one may have been an Romanos. So there's, <laughs> it wasn't exactly much competition between them. Again, and this is one of those things where throughout time, throughout history, we begin to see less and less of the importance of characters like Ephesian or, or Bagoas on, on Alexander when we're taught these things in, in academia, whether it be in high school or within college. How or why do you think these relationships kind of get watered down? In, in, in Alexander's case, I mean, it's a question of modern politics. Alexander is still politically important today because of his role in history and because he's one of the key examples of a successful king. So a lot of political forces want to own him. He was controversial in the same way under the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman emperors wanted to own him because he was an, an example of successful kingship. So they vaunted his reputation, whereas the Roman Republicans saw him as an enemy of their cause. Uh, and the same thing has happened today where uh, various political forces want to embrace Alexander as an example, or especially people like dictators um, and kings want to embrace Alexander. Well, they have a difficulty, often they need to have the church on their side. So they have the difficulty that Alexander is evidently um, somebody who's in engaging in gay relationships. And so what do they do? Well, they basically read uh, the account by Arian, which is uh, very ascetic in its approach. And Arian himself says that he doesn't want to mention any of the uh, private stories, which he, even if they're true, he says, I shouldn't be delving into the private side of Alexander's life. It's not proper and all of that. So uh, Arian is a really convenient source for them. It's just the case that various people have embraced Arian as being uh, therefore a convenient source to vaunt and to claim to be superior to the other great tradition, which mainly comes from Clitarchus of Alexandria, who we mentioned before, who very much embraced all the gossip and does tell all the stories about Bagoas and, and Hephaestion, and he's preserved to some extent in Curtius and Diodorus today, um, more, more Curtius than anyone else. I would argue that Curtius is essentially a Latin translation and abridgment of Clitarchus. Uh, and he actually, there are about 15 points I've made in my book uh, concerning Alexander the Great. There are about 15 points on which I think it's possible to show that Curtius is right and Arian is wrong. And there's almost no such points in reverse. For, for example, uh, the Battle of Gaugamela, uh, Arian has uh, this weird move where Al Alexander takes his cavalry ever further to the right, out and out and out and out, before suddenly charging back into the center. And Arian expresses this as this wonderful tactical move uh, to stretch the Persian forces. And he doesn't explain that uh, actually this would have stretched the Macedonian center even more. So why didn't Darius attack Alexander through the center? Arian doesn't explain any of this. And then you read Curtius on the Battle of Galgamela, and what he says is that Alexander received intelligence before the battle from a deserter that Darius had put a field of caltrops, which are like iron spikes, across the center of the battlefield in the hope that Alexander would charge his cavalry across them. Uh, and so, what Alexander did was he took his cavalry to the right and to the right and to the right to go around the field of Caltrops. Arian does the whole battle of Galgamela without mentioning the Caltrops. It's absolutely farcical. And that, that, that just sums up why people should not, not believe that Arian is the best source. Curtius is definitely the best source or Clitarchus before him. You are also one of the people who are on the hunt for the lost tomb of Alexander the Great. And it found it would probably be the greatest archeological find of, well, let's just say the century to be safe, but one of the greatest archeological finds ever, possibly. Yeah. How close are you? Well, there is a suspicion that we may actually have it in a sense uh, and have had it all along. Wow. Um, there's a sarcophagus from Alexandria which has always, as far as anyone can tell, been recognized as the tomb of Alexander the Great. 
Um, it was discovered in Alexandria by none other than Napoleon Bonaparte when he went to conquer Egypt in 1798 with his Army of the Orient. Uh, they conquered Alexandria and they, he took 50 scholars with him, they're called the savants, uh, and they compiled a thing called the Description de l'Egypte, one of the greatest books about Egypt ever written. Uh, it is a very great work that, in my mind, it's the greatest thing Napoleon ever did to sponsor that book. Uh, rather than the rest of his activities. Um, but, uh, and indeed, I've got some, I don't know if you can see them, but some of these engravings on the wall behind me are from the Description de l'Egypte by Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, he, he organized it. He didn't write anything in it, but he organized the scholars and commissioned it. Uh, and uh, he, one of, one of the things that's uh, highlighted in the Alexandria section is this sarcophagus which they found in, a, in the chapel, in the courtyard of a mosque in the middle of Alexandria. And it, uh, they don't say that uh, because it got, it got captured by the, they, they don't say it's the tomb of Alexander because it got captured by the British a few years later when the British uh, conquered Alexandria from the French. Um, this gets a bit complicated. But there's a chap called Edward Daniel Clark who is commissioned by the English general uh, to go and look at all the antiquities that the French had found. And he makes a big fuss about this sarcophagus and he talks to all the people in Alexandria and they tell him that this is the tomb of Alexander the Great. And we can trace back other sources, other people who visited Alexandria for several centuries before that. And they're talking about this sarcophagus in a mosque in the middle of Alexandria and saying it's the tomb of Alexander as well. So there is this sarcophagus that was found by Napoleon initially, then taken over by the British in 1801, three years later. And then it was transferred to the British Museum where it's been ever since. Uh, and it's always been recognized as the tomb of Alexander the Great. So you might well ask, why is it not acknowledged that Alexander's tomb has long since been known? Why? Uh, and why? Because when they learned how to read hieroglyphics, they read the hieroglyphics that are carved on the outside of this sarcophagus, and it has the cartouches of an Egyptian pharaoh, which is not Alexander, on it. And initially they thought, because they couldn't read hieroglyphics very well at first, they thought that it was a king who reigned 100, 150 years before Alexander visited Egypt. And it took more than 100 years uh, in, into the early 20th century before they realized that the king that this cartu these cartu cartouches refer to is Nectanebo II, who is the last native pharaoh of Egypt. But at that point, because it was the wrong name and because they thought it was a pharaoh from 100 years or more before Alexander, they used that as their reason for rejecting the authenticity of the sarcophagus. And if they had been right, it would have been a reasonable objection. But they weren't right. It was the sarcophagus of the pharaoh, the last, the very last Egyptian pharaoh of Egypt, who had fled from Egypt, is recorded to have fled from Egypt by Diodorus, one of the sources on Alexander as well, writing in the same history. He's recorded to have fled 10 years before Alexander arrived in Egypt. Now, if he fled Egypt, one thing is very obvious. He never used his sarcophagus. So who did? Well, guess who's the next pharaoh of Egypt to be buried in Egypt? Alexander the Great. Uh, there is no other. The, the, between the two, it's the Persians. And they never even visited Egypt. They were off in Persia. So they definitely never got buried in the sarcophagus of Nectanebo II. So it was sitting there when Ptolemy needed to bury Alexander in a hurry when he'd snatched the body uh, and re-diverted it. Uh, the regent of the empire, Perdiccas, was trying to take it back to Macedon at the time. Uh, in Syria, he diverted it down to Egypt. He sent an army to fetch it. He probably went with the army. He captured the body and he brought it back. He needed a tomb in a hurry. He needed a good quality tomb. So what did he do? 
he probably borrowed the empty tomb of the last Egyptian pharaoh that had been sitting there by then for 20 years unused and reused the sarcophagus. And there are quite a few other intersecting clues. There's a set of Greek statues which appear to have been erected by Ptolemy at a temple of next Nebo II in the cemetery area of the capital of Egypt, Memphis. Uh, and they are statues of Greek philosophers and poets. And the center of the circle was Homer, Alexander's favorite poet. Uh, and so these look suspiciously like funerary decorations for a tomb, uh, a Hellenistic era tomb, a very early Hellenistic era tomb, because Memphis ceased to be the capital uh, in the reign of Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, when the capital was moved to Alexandria. Uh, so there's a lot of things that come together like that. There's a story in the Alexander romance that we touched on a couple of times that Nectanebo II, explicitly Nectanebo II, the last native pharaoh of Egypt, was Alexander's father, and that he had seduced Olympias, Alexander's mother, and disguised himself as a snake and impregnated her and become Alexander the Great's father. Now, why would such a bizarre story, which came from Egypt, the Alexander romance was written in Alexandria, why would such a bizarre story exist? possibly because the Egyptians had seen Alexander's body in the sarcophagus of Nectanebo II in his tomb in Alexandria. A lot of this makes sense. What doesn't make sense now is to disregard the story of the sarcophagus because having corrected the absurd mistake which lasted for more than a century where they got the wrong pharaoh of Egypt uh, on the sarcophagus, having corrected that, you are left with absolutely no evidence whatsoever to reject the use of this sarcophagus by Alexander, except what is said by the leading opponent, uh, who's dead now, uh, and he just said, I do not think that either Philadelphus or Ptolemy Sosa would have deigned to bury a Greek king in an Egyptian sarcophagus. Complete racism. So the only thing you have to stand on uh, and, and it's nonsense as well. Ale uh, in Alexander's time, they greatly admired the Egyptian culture. Alexander was proposing to build a pyramid in imitation of the pyramids at Giza over the tomb of his father in Macedonia, for example, when he died. Uh, it's one of his last plans. So there is no basis for this whatsoever. So we have the sarcophagus um, and it's been in the British Museum, uh, but we still need more evidence to actually prove that it is Alexander's tomb. Well, there's another strand of my research, and that's where this is where things get really exciting. Uh, there are reasons to suspect that, well, if you ask the question, Alexander's body disappears in the fourth century AD, some 700 years after he died uh, in Alexandria. We cease to get mentions of it suddenly. Uh, and this happens at the end of the fourth century AD, uh, just when the Roman empire um, outlaws paganism, and Alexander's a pagan god by then, so you can see why this might have suddenly happened. Alexander's body disappears in Alexandria, uh, and it's, it's, it has been a famous mummified body in a great tomb in the heart of Alexandria. How could it go missing? Uh, suddenly, at the same time, because they needed a replacement for this as the core shrine in Alexandria for pilgrims and what have you, suddenly, a tomb of St. Mark the Evangelist, the founder of Christianity in Egypt and in Alexandria, springs into existence at exactly the same time. And I have followed a lot of clues and it looks as though it sprang up in the same place in the city as Alexander's tomb had been. Um, so this body is interesting because it still exists because the Venetians snatched it in 828 AD um, uh, when, Egypt had been taken over by Islam uh, and they took it back to Venice and they built the, um, the Basilica of San Marco, it's called the principal church in Venice to house this set of remains of one of the evangelists, the author of the gospel according to St. Mark. Uh, and that's where the body still is today. 
it used to be in the crypt, but um, in 1811, they brought it up because the crypt was getting flooded. And they've now put it in a marble sarcophagus inside the altar. Why is this interesting? In 1960, they were excavating down into the foundations of the Basilica di San Marco, the very oldest part, the part that was built um, right after this body was brought back to Venice. And they pulled out a chunk of third century BC, high status Macedonian tomb with uh, the starburst shield of the Macedonian kings carved onto it and wow. a sarissa and the copis sword of um, a, a Macedonian cavalryman on the side of it, hanging from a tasseled belt. There are exactly similar scenes from high status tombs, but only painted because they're only for noblemen in Macedonia itself from the same period, about 250 BCE. Uh, and, but this is in stone and it's absolutely magnificent quality. They've actually carved this very hard stone to give the shield its correct rotundity. So they haven't just carved it in shallow relief and it's about uh, 10 centimeters deep. Uh, so it curves right the way over like that. And they must have cut from the whole of the rest of the surface of this huge block of stone, which was originally about four feet by 10 feet. They carved 10 centimeters of the surface away just to leave the, the, the shield with its correct roundness uh, to be an exact imitation of the real shield in real life. So this is a massively high status piece of sculpture. It came from the highest status Macedonian tomb we even know about. Uh, and it, oh, wow. it's in the foundations of a church that was ha built to house a body, a mummified body brought from Alexandria that appeared at exactly the same time that Alexander the Great's bodies, body disappeared, mummy disappeared. And they, they, both these bodies were mummified, by the way, which is another interesting connection. And both of them have stories of how they... Alexander was um, mummified in honey and spices. And there's a story about the body of St. Mark uh, being brought back and how, how it was intensely perfumed in, in the Venetian Chronicles. Uh, so there are these strong hints that we might be talking about the same body here. Uh, it's certainly, these are in their different eras, the principal sets of mummified remains, the only ones we even know about that existed in Alexandria. So just connecting them, they seem to be connected in space because the tomb of uh, St. Mark and the tomb of uh, Alexander the Great seem to have been in the same place in Alexandria. They're connected in time because the tomb of St. Mark appears at the end of the fourth century, just when Alexander's tomb disappears. Uh, they're connected by this amazing piece of Macedonian tomb, which, uh, you would have to infer was brought back from Alexandria. The person who said it was a piece of Macedonian tomb is Professor Eugenio Polito. Uh, he's an Italian professor and he's a recognized international expert on Macedonian tombs. And he recognized it before I even started my work uh, on Alexander the Great's tomb and published it in a book in 1998. And he said that this chunk of Macedonian tomb must have been brought back to Venice from somewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, which kind of fits Alexandria. And it's, uh, and you know, he thought it couldn't possibly have come from Venice. There is nothing else remotely like it from the vicinity of Venice. So that's the background. Now, the most key thing of all, uh, I realized uh, in 2019 on a visit to Venice that I made with a couple of collaborators, uh, I decided to do some measuring of this chunk of stone, uh, this chunk of tomb. It's in a museum behind the Basilica di San Marco now. It's uh, the stone museum of the church uh, in Venice. Uh, and so you can just go and see it. It stood up there as one of the exhibits just inside the doorway. And uh, we measured it. We, we held up um, something of known size and took some photographs, in other words. Uh, and I was thinking that I would be able to prove whether they used the Egyptian foot or the Greek foot or the Ionic foot or the Roman foot for the size of the stone. And this might be a clue as to what its era was. And all I ended up proving was that it didn't really fit any of them. 
however, I suddenly realized what it did fit. It fitted the height of the sarcophagus in the British Museum. Uh, the, the sarcophagus in the British Museum is 118 centimeters tall, and so is this piece of sculpture uh, sitting in the museum in Venice. Uh, and you can work out, there's only half of it left, I should mention. The whole right hand side of this block has cracked away, but the sarissa comes down at a diagonal and it starts in the top left hand corner. And you know that Macedonian art from this period made things touch the edges and corners of the scene. Uh, so you know that the opposite, opposite end of the sarissa must have been in the bottom right hand corner. And that gives you a way of estimating how wide the block was as well. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, it fits as part of a casing that was exactly snugly fitted to the sarcophagus in the British Museum. So I am now fairly convinced that what we have in Venice is a chunk of the tomb casing of the sarcophagus that was built by one of the Ptolemies, probably either Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second Ptolemy, or Ptolemy uh, Philopator, the fourth Ptolemy. Both of those built tombs of Alexander in Alexandria. And when they did that, they decided to put a Macedonian tomb casing on the Egyptian sarcophagus that the first Ptolemy had used to bury Alexander the Great in. And this is where we're at at the moment. Andrew Michael Chug, there's just about nothing we haven't hit on. I wanna say thank you so much for being here and for doing this. Oh, you're, you're welcome. I think these are good stories. I think they could do with more people hearing them. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> <laughs> for sure.